A quick shout out to all of my awesome Patreon supporters, such as Baba Yega, Jeremy P, and Jeff Ang. Thank you so much for the support. It really does mean a lot. One man can most certainly make a difference, but how about three? Because when it comes to professional wrestling as we know it, the industry definitely owes a lot to three specific individuals. Who are these three men? Well, in order to get into that, we need to go back to the 20s. I mean, the 1920s. There we go. All right, so now that we're here, let's just go ahead and get into it. Because today... The Gold Dust Trio consisted of three very important figures in professional wrestling history. Let's begin with Joseph Toots Mott. Born in Garden Grove, Iowa, Mott grew up in Greenlee, Colorado. He would later debut in the carnival circuit and was discovered by Martin Farmer Burns, who was considered to be one of the best wrestlers in the country at the time. Now, Burns is listed as Mott's primary trainer. He even got to join the Farmer Burns group. However, there are claims that Mott actually started his training with Jack Taylor, who was the first major wrestling star out of Canada. And as for the nickname of Toots, it has a few possible origins, but the more accepted reason appears to be because of his youth, as he was the youngest member of the Farmer Burns team. From there, Toots was said to have become one of the most dangerous hook or catch wrestlers of the era, and afterwards he would be recruited by the next member of the trio, Ed Strangler Lewis. Lewis is a multi-time world champion and is considered one of the biggest star athletes of the 1920s, along with Jack Dempsey and Babe Ruth. He wrestled over 6,000 matches throughout his career and many of which were shoots, and yet somehow he only had 32 losses. Born in Nakusa, Wisconsin, Ed Lewis was born Robert Frederick. He took to sports early on and began wrestling professionally in his early teens. But he would develop more than just his wrestling skills at this age, because instead of going to school, he would learned a business side of professional wrestling too. And he did this all while becoming one of the very best wrestlers in the world who was nearly unbeatable. But I do mean nearly. As he did also manage to lose to Fred Beal, which is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of as Beal did also once defeat Frank Gotch. And even though he did get outclassed, Frederick still impressed his opponent as Beal took to the microphone after the match and told the whole crowd that one day Frederick would be champion. However, this embarrassed the future Ed Lewis down to his very core, and he would leave the world of competitive wrestling for a short while. Frederick would go on to work with promoters who worked matches, something that was definitely looked down upon amongst many of the legitimate wrestling community. However, humiliated, Frederick needed a change of pace, and he never looked at working in this light, which is definitely something that would come into play later on. Now, all ready to begin in the worked circuit, a mix-up prevented Frederick from wrestling for his scheduled dates, even though he was already advertised to be there. So to deal with this, promoter Bill Barn had wrestler Bob Maganoff wrestle as Bob Frederick instead. But now, after the mix-up was strained out and the real Frederick was able to wrestle, someone else already had his name. So he would have to come up with a new one. He took on his now famous moniker in tribute to Evan Stranger Lewis. And as a byproduct, changing his name also helped to keep his family away from learning about his wrestling exploits. But just like with Toots, this nickname's origin is up for debate as well, as it has also been claimed that this was the result of a sleeper hold he used in a match in France, although this could merely just be the kayfabe version of the story. Anyway, under this new nom de plume, Lewis would finally become a world champion. At least, kind of. To clarify, John Olin and Joe Stetcher had a world championship match that would come to an end when both men started brawling outside of the ring. And during this fight, Stetcher would injure his shoulder and was deemed unable to continue. And so, Olin was declared the winner, but he would not receive the championship. However, since this was the pre-internet days, fans had to rely on what the newspapers told them happened, and promoters would exploit the power of word of mouth. Olin's promoter would start saying that Olin was indeed the world champion even though he wasn't. But then, just five months later, and Olin would meet Ed Lewis in the ring, and Lewis was victorious. From there, Ed would promote himself as a world champion and really knew how to use his showmanship to become a star. Now, this unofficial world title would continue its questionable ways under Lewis, as he would lose on occasion but still claim for one reason or another that he was still the champion. And he would make these claims with the aid of his new manager. Who was this manager? Well, he would be the last member of the Goldust Trio, Billy Sandow. 
Sandow was born Wilhelm Bauman in Rochester, New York. It is believed that his name was taken from the strongman Eugen Sandow. And yes, Damien Sandow's name also derives from this too. Anyway, Sandow would work alongside his brother Max Bauman, and the two would travel all over promoting wrestling events. Now, Sandow did also wrestle too, and was also capable of teaching wrestling as well, as he did teach Ed Strangler Lewis his famous headlock during World War I. From here, the two men would begin working together, co-publishing Kinetic Stress, a collection of training and fighting techniques. And under Sandow, Lewis would also finally win the World Heavyweight Championship, which had now been unified with the Olin line. Then in the early 1920s, Sandow was looking for a grappler to be Lewis's sparring partner, as well as a backup opponent. Now, while trying to find someone who fit this role, they would turn to the advice of one Martin Farmer Burns, who recommended, of course, Toots Mon. This all led to the formation of the Gold Dust Trio, and most importantly, Slam Bang Western Style Wrestling. For you see, pro wrestling as we know it today was not always the norm. At the time, professional wrestling was good old fashioned mat wrestling, with Frank Gotch being the main star. However, after years of this, fans were getting bored of paying to see one slow methodical match. Sometimes just one bout could last into the late hours of the night. And on the visual front, this kind of wrestling really isn't all that enthralling, as it was mostly just two men lying down and holding each other all night long. So, in order to deal with this situation, Toots had a radical solution. Instead of the purely catch-based wrestling that was popular at the time, they would transition into incorporating a lot of different techniques that came from a variety of different styles, such as Greco-Roman, freestyle, lumber camp fighting, even boxing, and not to mention, theater. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering, how exactly can you incorporate both the moves of Freestyle and Gregor Roman? Well, that was the beauty of it. You see, as previously covered a long time ago on this channel, Greco-Roman forbids any hold below the waist, where freestyle is, anything goes. As a result of this, suplexes became more common in Greco-Roman due to the limitation as an effective way to attack your opponent, where in freestyle, a suplex isn't necessarily the most efficient takedown when you could go for your opponent's legs. However, moves like suplexes are still cool, but then again, so are certain leg takedowns. If only you could cherry pick and take the most impressive maneuvers from each discipline and use all of them. Too bad in a legitimate contest, that really wouldn't make any sense. Although, as mentioned in a previous episode, wrestling bouts had been fixed for a long time. It was nothing new. The carnival scene was notorious for it. Plenty of carnivals would get a local to take a dive to a carnival worker in a wrestling match. The townsfolk would bet their money on the local who they knew and trusted, while the carny would go in the crowd into betting against the carnival worker. This was all done to trick the marks out of their money. But when it came to slam bang western style wrestling, this was something completely different. Instead of just trying to swindle the marks out of their money, there was actually other advantages to fixing bouts in this way. By predetermining the finish and removing the actual competitiveness from the match, this allowed wrestlers to focus on giving the audience a really good show, and allowed them to incorporate a lot of moves like suplexes, arm drags, body slams, and even a bit of the old fisticuffs with good solid catch as catch can man wrestling, creating a super hybrid style that combined all the best possible worlds. This would become known as slam bang western style wrestling and it was a smash hit with the fans. This way, you could get the people to give you their money, but they wouldn't be betting on a contest that they had no hope of winning. Instead, they would just be paying to see a show. Now, of course, the biggest piece of this puzzle was planning the finish. Not only did this remove the competition and allow for more exciting demonstrations of moves, but it also allowed for more drama to be added to the program. Mott himself invented the vast majority of wrestling finishes for the matches, and most of the finishing holds. He is also credited with inventing the concept of a no contest, time limit draws, and double countouts. Not only that, but he also came up with the idea of crafting ongoing stories in order to entice fans to come back to see more. And even beyond this, by being able to plot out how long a match takes, the Gold Dust Trio was able to schedule more than one match for a show, thus giving people more variety. This also created the tiered wrestling card, since having multiple matches meant having to place them in different spots on the same show. So the most anticipated matches with the highest drawing stars were saved for last, in order to get the audience to stay for the entire show, even though these matches were presented at the top of the billing card. The secondary bouts were in the middle of the card, and the lower part of the 
card was designated to less popular wrestlers who were there to just do their job. The popularity of this new style overtook the entire industry, but that wasn't enough for the Gold Dust Trio as they decided that changing the business wasn't enough, they wanted to grow it. Sandow would move the shows from small theaters to large sporting venues, where they would make even more money. This allowed them to hire top grapplers, who were always paid on time and would be signed to exclusive contracts, all of which were kind of unprecedented at the time. As a result, other promoters were starved for talent, and so, with all of the wrestlers all of the money and all of the power, the Gold Dust Trio were the people to go through for any touring wrestler around the country, thus in a way becoming the first national promotion. In one year's time, they controlled the entire wrestling industry in the United States. Ed Lewis was the best wrestler in the world and he had the title to prove it. The trio would continue to book themselves strongly and keep themselves protected, but if anyone tried to go into business for themselves, they would find out the hard way that Lewis could go for real. And not only that, but they would also had to face the wrath of Mont, who was the top enforcer for the promotion, and he was definitely capable of stretching anyone who decided to veer off the path. Now, typically, it was the best grapplers, the best technical wrestlers who were deemed worthy of being on the top of the card, but wrestlers with a lot of personality were also given opportunities too, just for their ability to draw in fans alone. Slam bang western style professional wrestling was a hit with everybody, including the fans and workers. Under the Gold Dust trio, wrestlers were now making more money for fixed bouts than they ever could have for legitimate ones, and so there was little fear of anyone upsetting the apple cart and exposing the business. The new system worked out for everyone. At least, for a while. In 1928, the Gold Dust Trio would disband. Toot and Sandow would have a falling out over his brother Max, and Sandow and Lewis would go their separate ways due to a disagreement about Lewis's conditioning. Billy Sandow would go on to manage other wrestlers to championship glory, Ed Lewis would become a manager himself after his retirement and train the legend Lou Thez. As for Toots Mont, he would become a trainer and a promoter, working with such talents as Jim Londis and Stu Hart. But moreover, he would help to establish the Northeast Wrestling Territory as one of the biggest in the entire National Wrestling Alliance, and he would also mentor a young Vince McMahon Sr. as the two would go on to form the WWWF, which is now known as the WWE. Alright, so now let's go back to the present. Well, there you go, the history of the Gold Dust Trio and Slam Bang Western Style Wrestling. But what do you think? Let me know down in the comments, and don't forget to make sure you hit that subscribe button as well as the like button. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, Dave knows.